Ladies and gentlemen, as I sort of go about the county um, on various visits and things, I'm always conscious of uh, a good number of sidelong glances from people thinking, who the hell is this strange person in this vaguely Ruritanian uniform? <laughs> and so I thought perhaps I should offer some explanation. Um, I, I thought a first step towards that was actually to put my uniform on, although having said that, it is partly idleness on my, my part, because I spent earlier today attending the Princess Royal, who was on a visit to the county, and so it, there didn't seem any point in changing, but uh, um, so I, 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 I won't be so daring to say it's entirely for your benefit. Um, most people are, are too polite to ask me who the hell I am and what, and what I do. Uh, some are much more bold. I have on at least two occasions being mistaken for a senior member of the Salvation Army. <laughs> and I, remembering, I remember arriving to take the salute at a parade in, in, up in the north of the county a couple of years ago and being greeted by the man on the gate saying, all right, mate, good to see you. You've come to do the first aid, I suppose. <laughs> There's a lot, lot of mis misapprehensions about. Um, someone sidled up to me once and pointed to my Sir John's cross that I wear, saying, uh, is that the Iron Cross? <laughs> and when I first put the Queen's Diamond Jubilee medal on, someone came up to me and said, glad to see you're a West Ham supporter. <laughs> Anyway, at least, at least I have been, oh, the best one of all, actually, was at a, a, a civic dinner, um, not in this part of the county, elsewhere, I won't say where, uh, where uh, it was that time after the dinner where people mill about and sort of swap chairs, and this lady came and plonked herself down beside me and said, now, I know who you are, you're the Queen's consort. <laughs> not quite. I have at least been spared the indignity of a colleague of mine, past colleague of mine, the Lord Lieutenant of Herefordshire, who arrived one day at the town hall for some function or other in his uniform and was stopped by the man on the door saying, oh no mate, you can't come in here, the band are coming in round the back. <laughs> so you will understand why I don't linger in foyers too often unless someone asks me to hail a taxi for them. <laughs> Cue this side for the one nines. So uh, essentially, I, I, I will try and answer the question of what is a Lord Lieutenant. Uh, in simple terms, uh, the Lord Lieutenant is the personal representative of Her Majesty the Queen within the boundaries of, of a particular county, in this case, of course, Essex. Uh, it's a post that goes back nearly 500 years. Uh, and it was established during the reign of, of King Henry VIII uh, with, as was stated then, the express purpose of to ensure maintenance of order and the Queen's peace in the, in the shires, which was in itself a bit strange because that was a job that the, the High Sheriff had been doing uh, for many hundreds of years since medieval times. Uh, the role of High Sheriff goes at least as far back as Doomsday Book. But the Lord Lieutenant in those days had much more of a military role than a civil role. Because in those days, this country had no standing army of any sort. Up till then, the King had relied on the feudal system that when he wished to go to war, he would simply call in the favours that the feudal system uh, involved of, of, of people owing him night service or uh, responsibility for, for, for providing X number of armed men or whatever, something like that. Well, by, by the reign of King Henry, that had broken down completely. So there was no means of the king uh, raising an army. And so something called the militia was, uh, was established which was ordinary members of the public who were compelled, rather, rather, rather similar to today's territorial army, but much more uh, 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 compulsory, uh, ordinary civilians were required to take up arms when commanded to do so under the command of their, uh, of their Lord Lieutenant. So in theory at least, uh, every summer, all men between the ages of 16 and 60 uh, were required to attend a muster 
for four days to be drilled in arms. And there was also a, a camp of that sort on Tiptree Heath, or indeed more locally on, on Warley Common. The other reason for establishing this sort of separate system of Lord Lieutenants rather than High Sheriffs was that I think there was a feeling uh, that some of the High Sheriffs were just getting a bit too independent and therefore the King wanted to have a sort of um, more uh, immediate uh, relationship with the Lord Lieutenant as a sort of countervailing force. Um, anyway, in, in those days, uh, Lord Lieutenants, uh, well in fact in those days they were just called Lieutenants, the Lord bit came rather later. They were appointed for a whole group of counties. The first Lord Lieutenant of Essex was the third Duke of Norfolk, but he, had all, he was also Lord Lieutenant of another 11 counties. Uh, but nowadays it's one, one county, one Lord Lieutenant. Uh, I'm the fourth member of my family to, to hold the office, all in, all in Essex, I have to say. Um, and I am round about the 60 se 62nd uh, Lord Lieutenant of Essex. I say round about because there have been certain periods when there have been joint, joint holders or indeed no one at all, and so it's difficult to uh, get, get a fixed number. Uh, and the role of past Lord Lieutenants contains a lot of names which will be very familiar to, to you. Uh, Howard occurs the most frequently, there have been seven of those, but four each from the Mild May, Maynard and Rich families, and also several mentions of De Vere, Braybrook and Darcy. And like most civic roles, like mayors and, uh, uh, and high sheriffs, the Lord Lieutenants uh, hold office for a, a, a certain, somewhat indeterminate period. Most uh, other civic officers uh, hold office for either one or two years, but that's not so of Lord Lieutenant. Um, there is a sort of, I was going to say requirement, but a recommendation that Lord Lieutenant should serve for at least 10 years. But that really is a sort of guideline to indicate what sort of age uh, uh, should, people should be when they're appointed, uh, rather than uh, a minimum. My predecessor, Lloyd Raybrook, did serve for almost exactly 10 years to the day. And uh, the sort of clue um, uh, that he was really should have gone until on until the mandatory retirement age of 75 was when he received a letter back from the cabinet office saying thank you so much for notice of your early retirement <laughs> and so that was the clue that uh, slightly uh, blotted his copybook in that respect so I've, I've done just about just over 10 years now actually so I've got another five years to go to a mandatory retirement. Uh, that, that's not actually a particularly long term of office uh, in Lord Lieutenant uh, terms. Uh, the, there was a former Lord Lieutenant of Gloucestershire, uh, not, not very long ago actually, who, who was Lord Lieutenant of, of Gloucestershire for, 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 um, for 47 years. Um, he must have been jolly young when he was appointed, <laughs> or very old. When, in those days, there was no mandatory retirement age, you just went on and on. And the story goes that not so many years ago, uh, Her Majesty was visiting some county in the west of England when there was a, a particularly decrepit Lord Lieutenant. And they arrived at this venue, and the Lord Lieutenant got tangled up with his sword and failed to get out of the car at all. And so Her Majesty was left with the task of introducing herself. You know, good morning, I don't think we've met. <laughs> and apparently, so the story goes, she's, afterwards she said, I've had, I've had enough of this, I've had enough of these decrepit Lord Lieutenants. They give up when they're 75, I'm sorry. Anyway, so what does the Lord Lieutenant do? Well, um, I, I, the way I always put it rather facetiously is that he does, he or she, does everything that the Queen might do if only he had, only she had the time. So um, I can't exactly say that she sends her apologies for not being here this evening, but that's the sort of idea. But it, and essentially it really is as vague as that. Um, in the official handbook there are certain duties which are 
well, strongly recommended and others which uh, just uh, seem fitting, but a few of them are absolutely <laughs> mandatory. Um, and even now, I, I, I'm never entirely sure because we, we, we all sort of plough our own furrow and, and so I don't know really where, how what I do compares with what happens even over the border in Suffolk or, or Hertfordshire and um, we, we, we have a, a sort of annual meeting every year, sort of AGM of, of the Lord Lieutenant's Association and uh, my, we often sort of hear of things that other people are doing and a certain uh, um, embarrassment that we think, oh, well, perhaps we should be doing that. But there was a particular instance this year, actually, because it emerged um, that apparently for many years this has been the custom for Scottish Lord Lieutenants personally to deliver the telegram that the, the Queen sends to centenarians. And all the Scottish Lord Lieutenants were up in arms because as a result of the Data Protection Act, this is no longer possible because they're not allowed to release the names of the people who are 100 years old. And anyway, this argument was going on, and I'm afraid all my English colleagues were keeping very quiet because we certainly didn't want to get <laughs> involved with anything like that. Anyway, so I, I, I can't really give you a, a sort of um, uh, prescribed list of, of, of duties that, that are necessary. And it really boils down to simply responding to whatever particular invitations I receive. Um, I did try and um, sort of compile a list of all the different kinds of things I do. And I, actually, I, I, I'm surprised myself that it's such a wide range. And so I apologize in advance if this sounds too much of a catalog. But that's the way it goes. So it involves present the presentation of all sorts of awards, honors, and decorations. Uh, to a greater or lesser extent expressly on behalf of Her Majesty. That includes the Queen's Award to Industry, which uh, Essex gains usually something like three or four of those each year. Similarly, there's another thing called the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, which you may or not, may not have heard of because it is quite new. And that, that, is, that is like the Queen's Award to Industry, only for voluntary groups. And again, uh, we, it, was, it was instituted at the Queen's Golden Jubilee, and again, Essex gets about two or three of, the, of those a year. It, it would not, be nice if there were more, actually, but because it's not very widely known, we don't really get a lot of nominations. So I do sort of encourage you, if you know of any local groups, who, voluntary groups, uh, who do wonderful work, don't, don't hesitate. Anyone can nominate. Uh, not really the group, they can't nominate themselves, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're very keen to encourage that. I also uh, uh, present from time to time military campaign medals for members of the TA, completing uh, uh, active service in the Middle East, and of course uh, uh, in recent years there's been a, a, an awful lot of that. Uh, the TA now do play a very active, you know, in the old days you used to join the TA really just for the skiing and the drinking, but these days they actually do uh, go on active service. Uh, I also, now that the British Empire Medal has been re reintroduced, that now as a matter of course is presented by the local Lord Lieutenant, so we had our first uh, investiture for the BEM, about eight recipients in Essex earlier this year. And it's also open to other people who earn more senior honours, the, the uh, MBE or the <coughs> OBE or the CBA, if they, CBA, if they so wish, they can forego the trip to the palace and if they're, you know, if they're not well enough to make the journey to London or, or circumstances make that impossible, they can opt to have their local Lord, Lord Lieutenant um, present it locally and, and in many ways actually that's that's more fun really because you are severely limited to the number of guests you can take to, to a palace investiture whereas uh, if you have it on your own turf it, you can make a real party of it and uh, only the other year there was a very much loved lady now sadly deceased uh, in Castle Point who received the MBE 
And she had this this presentation where there were about two or three hundred people there as uh, to, just to celebrate the uh, the event with her. I also, as a matter of routine, present long service medals for the police and the fire service. Used to do so for the ambulance service, but they've gone regional now, so uh, they don't have any real sort of presence in Essex. Well, of course they have a presence in Essex, but um, it's done on a sort of regional basis, so I don't do that anymore. Is it? Um, interestingly, uh, with the ambulance service, I got the impression, I'm, I may be maligning them slightly here, but um, the, the, the number of long service awards that were handed out on any particular evening was governed by the number of full dress uniforms that were available. <laughs> because the ambulance, the, the ambulance men don't often wear their sort of pucker uniform, and so there are only a limited number uh, that exist, and so they couldn't have more recipients than there were uniforms, anyway. Uh, I present a, uh, a wide variety of mis miscellaneous prizes and awards, uh, too numerous to mention individually, but uh, for organisations like St John Ambulance, the Red Cross, the Essex Plainfield Association, Young Person of the Year, um, and from time to time school prize givings, and even just from time to time bunches of flowers for retiring secretaries of some organisation or other. But I also represent Her Majesty in, in, in a more general sense, uh, taking the salute at military and other parades, particularly Remembrance Day, British Legion functions, the Queen's Birthday salute at Colchester, Battle of Britain Day, usually in Chelmsford, and Merchant Navy Day in Harwich. And then there are uh, numerous official functions such as civic dinners, civic services, uh, university degree days, which I just sort of make an appearance at. Uh, there is also unveiling commemorative plaques and memorials and opening new public buildings of various kinds. Uh, the sort of range in recent years has been everything from a climbing wall, new climbing wall to um, new sheltered housing. Uh, n not in the same place, I mean. <laughs> but uh, so there's quite a range there. And I, 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 I've lost count, actually, uh, really have, of the number of new, new or refurbished war memorials which I've um, sort of rededicated or unveiled during the last few years. It really is quite remarkable um, how there has been an upsurge in interest, which of course is wonderful, really. Um, uh, even as far, uh, as far away as Italy, uh, you, you may say, what on earth has Italy got to do with Essex? Well, it was um, admittedly rather belated memorial to the members of the Essex Regiment who fell at Monte Cassino uh, in 1944. Um, slightly late in the day, you would say, but nevertheless, uh, um, I, I think it was uh, uh, fitting. Um, the only thing I don't do is supermarkets, so <laughs> don't even ask. Uh, another sort of string to my bow, if you like, I, I act as patron or president of a whole host of, of county organisations, and I can never remember from one moment to the next um, what is on the list and what isn't. Um, but just to say, it includes Scouts and Guides, British Legion, Red Cross, CPR Essex, Essex Gardens Trust, the Essex Community Foundation, Essex Environment Trust, Disability Essex, Essex Playing Fields, and on and on and on. But none of those, I hasten to say, are very active roles. Um, I, I have the honour to be a, an honorary member of, of, of three Rotary Clubs, and I, I say in that context, and this refers to these uh, patronages, if you like, uh, honorary in the sense of never, in the sense of never turns up, or not very often anyway. Uh, there are various other things which, uh, in, in theory, uh, are much less frequent. Uh, one, which I've never had to do, actually, is that you, you will often have seen in the reports of funerals and memorial services, uh, Her Majesty the Queen was, was represented by some, such and such. And so if anyone distinguished in the county who the Queen thinks she should sort of have a representative at their funeral, then I would be the one to do that. It's only happened once in my uh, tenure 
when Sir John Ruggles Rice died, but I happened to be in hospital at the time, so my my deputy, my, my vice had to do that one. Uh, there was another, there's another sort of duty which I thought at the outset would be very rare, and that is, it is the Lord Lieutenant's duty to greet visiting foreign heads of state when they land on English soil. And I thought, well, not many heads of state fly Ryanair, so <laughs> that won't happen very often. But of course, actually, in the event, it, it, it has a bit. Uh, I, I had the honour of greeting Obama when he came to the uh, for his state visit some, two, what was it, five, four or five years ago now? And of course, with the Olympic Games, I was expecting to be overwhelmed because at one stage there were 120 heads of state going to arrive. But as it turned out, most of them went to City Airport. But uh, there were uh, eight or nine which I greeted at uh, at, uh, at Stansted uh, on, on the sort of private, the rather exclusive northern side of the airport. Which I don't, I don't know if you know any of the, of the, the terminals there, but. Uh, they, are, they really are rather special, not, not, not like the southern side at all, um, uh, including President Putin. Um, and that was interesting in that um, he was uh, soul of uh, correctness and, and everything like that, but um, the usual practice when a head of state arrives is that the, 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 that country's ambassador is there. And as the, the plane draws to a halt, the stairs go up, and the ambassador goes aboard to conduct his head of state off the aircraft. And that's what we did most of the time, except when the Russian plane arrived, and the Russian ambassador was there, and he made a move to go up the steps to greet his president, and this enormous security man stepped in front of him and said, Niet, not even you. <laughs> So there we are, we knew where we, where we were placed. Um, a few other sort of odds and ends, if you like. Um, quite a few of the church parishes in the south of the county uh, are under the patronage of the Lord Chancellor. So uh, when they have a, a, the a induction ceremony for a new vicar, I go to sort of represent the, uh, the Lord Chancellor and, as it were, hand over the keys. Um, other sort of general activities, and one which has become very frequent, much to my uh, surprise, certainly, and in a way, such like dis dismay, is that I preside at citizenship ceremonies, uh, swearing in new UK citizens, which for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, has been a sort of public ceremony before it was done sort of privately in, in the registrar's chambers but now it is done um, and when they introduced this I was invited to sort of take the chair if you like and I thought well you know it could be once every couple of months I expect you know not really. we have two sessions every fortnight at uh, County Hall with about I mean with, with with about 30 people at every session. So not so very long ago, we, we swore in our 10,000th ten new UK citizen, which is astonishing. They come from every country in the world. I mean, some of the obvious ones, like Zimbabwe and, and Uzbekistan, you can sort of um, expect, but literally from every country in the world, including the United States, Canada, Australia, everywhere, uh, even some some EU countries, and and you know you have to ask why um, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, perhaps it's just us being you know being British about it, but it, it it costs a pretty penny to go through the process. It costs several hundred pounds to complete all the documentation and take the test and attend the the the, the, the official ceremony, and um, one just has to. I suppose be proud that so many people uh, do opt to give their loyalty to our country and you know we may be surprised that they wish to do so but it seems to be a fact of the matter and of course um, it is actually because they pay quite a lot of money a uh, substantial contribution to county council funds so uh, I haven't done the maths but I, 
it, it must represent a few pence of all of your council tax. <laughs> I do have a, also a part to play in the awarding of honours. Um, I carry out uh, the assessments, or at least uh, a few of my deputies do it on my behalf, for the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, which I mentioned before. Uh, I also draw up recommendations for invitations to the Royal Garden parties each year, and we get an allocation of about 60 couples every year. Uh, and then in relation to the honours, other honours like uh, OBE and MBE, um, the Lord Lieutenants used to be much more closely involved in that, you know, essentially they were the sort of de gatekeepers of the system, that if you, if you, want, you wanted to recommend someone, you had to go through the Lord Lieutenant. That is completely not the case now. It is open to absolutely anyone to make a nomination, but normally during the process, um, we, uh, uh, we do get an op opportunity to comment, um, to, uh, as the, the guidance nicely puts it, make collateral comment to validate the weight of the nominations and its letters of support. Um, not an easy thing to do, actually. I am also ex officio Castos Structurorum, which uh, is Keeper of the Rolls, and the rolls in question are the role of the names of the uh, uh, justices of the peace of the county. So what that entails is I am chairman of what's called the Lord Chancellor's Advisory Committee, which is the body which selects candidates to be recommended to the Lord Chancellor for appointment as justice of the peace, and equally uh, with the duty of inquiring into any complaints made against serving justices and, and makes uh, reputable makes recommendations to the Lord Chancellor accordingly. Um, the options we have in that respect are either no action, uh, a reprimand, or with or without a requirement for retraining, or in some extreme cases, disbarment. It, it doesn't happen all that op often. It, we do use, we haven't had a case now, I think, for well over a year, which is good, which is good. Um, but it does happen from time to time. Uh, perhaps, I, I suppose the only unavoidable duty in a way I have is supervising the arrangements for and attending visits to the county by members of the royal family. And royal in this context means uh, Her Majesty the Queen herself, of course, but also all those members of the family who bear the title um, uh, Royal Highness. Uh, if they're not royal highnesses, they're not royal, as far as we're concerned, and they have to look after themselves. Um, it, it, this happens more frequently than you might think, because they tend only to be reported very locally. Uh, but we do get certainly five or six royal visits a year. Um, uh, and people often say to me, oh, you know, Essex is, is, is ignored, Essex is not considered a... Um, a high priority, but I don't think it's true. I think we get more or less our fair share. Um, so, uh, and, but my role in that is is I have no say whatsoever, unless anyone thinks differently. And, and some people think that I sort of, I just ring up the Queen and say, right, I've arranged for you to come on the 29th. It doesn't, I'm afraid it's not like that at all. I have no say where or when such visits take place. Um, but it is, on the other hand, again, open to anyone to send, I, I don't say they'll be successful, for it to, to, to send an invitation. Uh, it, if you're minded to do that, you do want to send it to a specific member of the family, rather than just a general one, because they are, they've got enough of their own invitations without looking at the general ones. Um, but it is a good idea to let, if anyone's doing that, it's a good idea to let me know. Not that I have any uh, sway in the matter, as I said, uh, because it is all something of a lottery, but I can perhaps advise what might find favour um, or what, el what else is in prospect and uh, put together package deals to make a visit more uh, sort of high profile, if you like. So it sometimes works. So once an invitation is accepted, we, it is then our responsibility in the county to, uh, to, make the, to, to plan and make arrangements down to the very smallest de detail. I mean, everything has to be approved by the household in question, but we have to uh, uh, make the proposal, including security. 
when a royal person comes, they, they never bring more than one personal protection officer with them. And so it's Essex Police, effectively, who have to provide all the local security that is required. And that, that sort of varies according to the rank. Um, obviously, if it's the Queen, then you get the full search with the dogs and lifting manhole covers and the real uh, McCoy. With the more junior members, it's a bit more relaxed than that. Uh, so it's all a very elaborate process and we probably go through anything up to six or seven draft plans before it's, before it's all fi finalised. Uh, it's, it's always up to the host organisation to propose the programme in the first place, but uh, our role really is to provide uh, sometimes a good deal of guidance, uh, instruction in protocol and that kind of thing, and not unusually a fair amount of restraint because some people's ideas are a bit over the top. Um, in the event, I think we can say that here in Essex we do these things extremely well. Um, I think I, I, I mean, that's not down to me. I, I have a great deal of support uh, in that respect. And I, I think I can confidently say that, because I have, well, I remember one particular uh, uh, occasion going as an ordinary punter to a royal visit to Redbridge, and it was chaos. Um, but we, we do things uh, much better. There are occasional hiccups, um, which I was going to, but as this, this is going to be recorded, I thought I'd better not. <laughs> Nothing serious. Oh, so. No, no. Well, I, I mean, we did lose the Prince of Wales for a short moment. <laughs> but we recovered him eventually. Um, and there have been slight hiccups like that, but uh, only we notice, nobody else does. So uh, all this sort of adds up to, I, I did actually do a sort of toss-up the other day, it was very rough and ready, um, uh, and I was surprised myself saying, in, as I said, I've been doing it for about 10 years, and, and it came to something in excess of 1,700 <laughs> different engagements. Uh, so it, it does work out about four or five engagements a week, um, and, and a bit of office work besides, but it's certainly not a full-time job or anything like it. The one thing it does not involve, and this is stated again and again, is it does not involve any executive power whatsoever. Um, occasionally I'm called upon to be a sort of referee, catalyst or bridge builder, but uh, um, I don't have, uh, now the militia is abolished, I don't have any private army at my disposal. They, I remember a few years ago the TA celebrated its centenary and the TA essentially replaced the militia and, and I, I was called upon to sort of you know, appear a phrase and I, I did point out that I wasn't quite sure that we little lieutenants were celebrating the TA because it, it marked the abolition of our private armies and we would have much preferred to go back to that arrangement. But I, I, I do, as I say, have considerable help with all this um, apart from my own invaluable secretary, Gina Cordwell, without who I could not survive, I do have support from Lorraine King, Sue Yule, and Kim Mundy, who are the, the chairman of the county council's PAs, and certainly they, they do all the sort of royal visit organisation bit. I also have um, a number of deputies, uh, an extremely large number actually. Uh, um, there is a complicated formula based on population which allows me to appoint up to 66 deputies. Uh, now, I can't say that the list is, is absolutely up full to the brim at the moment, uh, but they, essentially they're not deputies in the sort of usual sense of the word. Like they, they do, uh, they're very helpful to me from time to time, uh, particularly helping with, not me with honours nomina nominations and, and other things. But they're not, really not supposed to be deputies in the sense of standing in for me. Um, it's really just a recognition of service to the community rather than the job. And I, I, I sometimes, Peter might be able to confirm this, but I, I sometimes have difficulty explaining this, explaining this to new appointees who, who, who uh, are ready for action and <laughs> anxious to <laughs> run here for that. And then I have to explain, no, no, it's, it's not quite like that. You know, once in a lifetime you will be called upon to do something, perhaps. <laughs> Um, which is sometimes a bit of a disappointment, but as I say, it's a recognition more than anything. 
So uh, it's not really for me to say whether uh, this office performs any useful function. Um, uh, to be serious for a moment, uh, in today's society where informality is all, ceremony and ritual gets an awfully bad press as being pompous and out of date, but I, I think it's a great mistake to ignore its importance. Formal procedures and formalities remain as uh, of value, as a way of publicly marking that of which we all approve and, and wish to encourage. And I think people would be very disappointed if, if there weren't these um, institutions to actually give people a pat on the back and everything like that. Uh, people would miss that. I uh, know, I know it could, that duty could be carried out by other officials such as mayors and everything, but it probably is a good idea to have some individual orchestrating that public approval who is not beholden to any person or organisation other than the Crown. So that's my case for the defence. Now, uh, the, the question that leads on to is why, why should it be me? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. Um, or, or I don't know what the, the selection process is. Uh, it just happened. Um, the first thing to say is, although I am, a, I am commissioned by Her Majesty personally, and she signed the, signed the commission herself, but she really has nothing to do with it. It's all done by number 10. Um, there's certainly nothing in the way of a formal application or interview, there's no question of providing a CV or anything like that. Uh, the clerk to the lieutenancy, who is usually a senior member of the county council, senior officer of the county council, uh, one way or another draws up a short list. Uh, those on the list are asked if they would allow their name to go forward. That's sent up to number 10. Number 10's uh, senior appointment secretary makes a visit to the county to take soundings, and it's all of secret and behind closed doors and everything like that. And at some moment after that, the announcement is made. Um, how it all happens, I don't know, but there we are. Uh, it, it is a very unusual process in this day and age where everything has to be advertised and done in the open because this certainly isn't. But then it is, I suppose you could say, a rather unusual job. It, it formerly used to be almost entirely confined to retired senior army or navy officers and or landowning peers. Well, I, I do happen to be the latter, but uh, nevertheless I am possibly a bit unusual in this respect these days. Uh, indeed, a quarter of all the Lord Lieutenants in the country are now ladies, uh, which you couldn't have said that 50 years ago at all. It does require sort of, I won't say special qualifications, because they're not special, they're just a bit unusual. Obviously, it, it, someone's going to have time to spare, because it is quite time consuming. Um, it, 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 you do have to be available. Um, there is a sort of prescribed limitation on, on, on my absence. I, if, if, I, uh, if I wish to be uh, absent from the county for more than three weeks of time, I have to expressly um, seek Her Majesty's permission before doing so. Um, I don't think it necessarily will be that withheld, but nevertheless I do have to go through the formality. Public appearances obviously <coughs> play a major part, so you've got to have someone who's relatively at ease uh, in that situation, uh, but on the other hand, not someone who's going to be carried away by all the attention and develop some sort of personality cult. Um, it is all about the office uh, and the in institution it represents and, and not the individual. It's very important, I said, you know, it involves no executive power whatsoever, so it's important that the person doing it has no ambition for such uh, executive power or influence, and, and, um, and that may rule out people who are sort of accustomed to running big organisations or giving orders, might find that a difficult concept to grasp, but uh, they don't have any power. And specifically, uh, uh, you've got to have no political or other allegiances. Uh, complete impartiality uh, at all times is absolutely essential. And they do take this very seriously. Um, my predecessor, Lord Braybrook, uh, 
had his wrists slapped for putting uh, no to the Euro stickers on his correspondence. Um, so he got his wife to put, put he got it, his wife to put it on hers instead. It's all right. And you do have to be reasonably fit because you do get about a bit. But it's a very nice job to have. You get to meet a lot of interesting, charming people. And the important thing really is all the duties, virtually all the duties, uh, involve celebrating good news. And so it's all very upbeat. Um, there's, there's, a, there's certainly no pay. There's a, a, a modicum of expenses, but a lot of free meals. <laughs> She no, she doesn't actually. No, she hates me saying this, but uh, the deal was I could be Lord Lieutenant so, so long as she didn't have to come to. <laughs> and, uh, the problem is, of course, it's sort of all or nothing, really. You know, it would be very difficult to sort of pick and choose and go to some things and not others because that would cause resentment and everything like that. So um, she thinks, well, having to. to always be at my side, it's better just to keep in the background at all, which uh, is a pity in a way, but there we are. Could we have a little history about it? Ingotstern Hall. God, how long you got? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, asking the other day whether it was true that when Queen Elizabeth I visited Ingotstern Hall, she arrived with 2,000 horses. Where did she put them all? <laughs> well, good question. I, I mean, the only sort of action, I mean, it, it, it certainly happened. Uh, and, and to what extent that sort of detail is just uh, supposition, I don't know. Because, I mean, the only bit of written evidence we have is the, is the shopping list of, of groceries. <laughs> for the visit, which is pretty substantial, I have to say. Um, but we, we don't know exactly how many people uh, she brought, um, precisely how long she was there, or, or what she did while she was there, really. Um, so um, it may well be. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's not something you sort of welcome, really, because it, <laughs> it was a bit on the expensive side. <laughs> Lord, Lord Petrie, <clears throat> for your role, what is the boundary of Essex? Because historically it was the River Lee. And no, yes, no, unfortunately the London boroughs are lost to us. Um, but it still, it still includes Southend and, and Thurrock, you know, the unitaries. So you didn't officiate so. at the Olympics then? No, no, not, it, not even the, the mountain biking. No, um, <laughs> no, I, I just greeted the head of state, that's all. Yeah, the back. Yeah, look, Peter, some 25 years ago, when our son was in the Army Cadets, he had the honour of being appointed Lord Lieutenant's Cadet. Yes, yes. What did that role entail? It was never very full of time. Well, it's, it's a sort of annual thing. Um, uh, I mean, the Army Cadets do it, the Air Cadets do it, uh, Sea Cadets don't, actually, but, but St John Ambers do it as well. It's really a sort of, as it were, Cadet of the Year. Um, and as part of that, uh, the opportunity is given for them to sort of accompany me uh, on, on sort of official engagements and that kind of thing, which um, some are more interesting than others, frankly. <laughs> we do, we, I know in some counties the Lord Lieutenant get, Cadet gets to sort of assist with royal visits, we, we find that rather difficult to organise because um, royal visits uh, uh, involve a lot of dashing about in fast cars. Um, I was apparently doing 100, not me, the police driver was doing 120 on the, uh, on the A12 today with me in the back, which was quite an experience, I'll tell you. And, and it's therefore difficult sort of having 
extra people on board. But it, essentially, they're, they're the selected by uh, the ACF as their cadet of the year. The First Lord Peter, who became the first lieutenant of Essex, was about 18th century or something like that? No, no, they're much earlier actually. I, I think William Peter, uh, who's the one who built Pinkston Hall, he. Uh, he, he was one of sort of my list of four. I think he was Lord Lieutenant. Certainly his son was Lord Lieutenant, the first Lord Peter, uh, at the time of the Armada. So uh, when you see those pictures of Elizabeth I addressing the troops at Tilbury, that is the Essex militia under the command of my ancestor John Peter. And then the third one was the sixth Lord Peter, who uh, was... Uh, Lord Lieutenant, for a short period during the reign of James II. James II, as you all know, uh, in an attempt to restore England to the Church of Rome, appoint, made all these Catholic appointments, uh, and one of them was uh, the Catholic Lord Lieutenant of Essex, Lord Peter. Uh, but that was only very shortly before the Gorish Revolution, and uh, as soon as that happened, the Essex militia said, we're not going to serve any bloody papists, and so he had to resign. You mentioned, uh, Lord Peter, about the High Sheriff yes. and the arrangement then. Yes. What's the arrangement now between the it, it, It's very sort of vague, really, because, I mean, the, 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 these days the, the High Sheriff's role is has become, um, not so many years ago, the High Sheriff did have a few residual actual duties. I mean, all, all High Court writs were issued in the name of the High Sheriff. But now that role too is, is almost entirely uh, ceremonial. Nominally, the, 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 high, the High Sheriff is, has a sort of responsibility, an over, oversight responsibility for everything to do with the justice system the police, the courts, everything like that. But there again, as I explained, I, it's me who's, president, who's chairman of the Lord Chancellor's advisory committee appointing magistrates. So it's all a bit sort of vague. So, <laughs> yes. How is the hall today? It's all right. <laughs> Um, well, it's it, uh, my son lives there, so I, I, my wife and I lived at, in the Dower House at, at Brittle Park. Uh, but uh, so it is; it's still a lived-in house. Uh, some of us, admittedly, is now um, let out as offices, and we open it to the public, and um, we are available for weddings. <laughs> um, uh, but it, but a set, we're still very keen on keeping it as essentially a lived-in house. It's always a pleasure to welcome an old friend, and Lord Peter has been a friend to Stock and he's been to this society, as he was to Jane and I when we had the privilege of being Mary and Mary at Chelmsford um, some years ago. Um, he, Lord Peter has been most entertaining explaining the nature of this role and uh, mentioned at one point its Ruritanian aspect and, and actually asked the question, does it serve a purpose? I think actually it's apparent from some of his remarks um, that it really does. Um, there, it's celebrating good news. This is very true. It's true of the mayoralty as well. There are all sorts of occasions when people who have been putting in effort for a long time reach a 25th anniversary, or indeed a 50th or a 100th anniversary. And you want to mark this in some way. And it's not a sufficient occasion for the Queen to be there in person. Um, but you want a local dignitary to turn up um, so that everybody can see that there is public recognition of what's been going on. Um, and the Lord Lieutenant is an important part of that. Um, he's mentioned that a variety of occasions there was one he didn't actually mention, which I recall very well. Um, we've gone around in recent years to recognising the contribution of various people at the time of the Second World War, which rather got taken for granted and not mentioned at the time, including a, a large number of women, one group of which was the Land Army Girls. And the Land Army Girls were actually 
some 60 years <coughs> after the event, um, given a medal. And they were invited to receive that, I think in each borough um, yes, yes. and district. But certainly there was an occasion in Chelmsford, and both Lord Peter and I were there. And I was extremely impressed, because of course, um, with his experience of matters of the land, he was able to ask all of these ladies questions about what it was that they did and pursue them, you know, in a way that I simply wouldn't have been capable of doing. Um, you know, recalling things about how things were done at that time and so on. Um, and I've no doubt at all that all of the people who attended and got those medals so belatedly knew that they had been recognised and recognised and felt that the occasion had been worthy um, of the occasion. It you know, really was done in a delightful way, a one that they, I'm sure, will always have been there. So, Lord Peter, thank you very much. Thank you for such an entertaining um, speech tonight. And thank you for the considerable amount of time and effort that you continue to put in. You're, you're only mayor for a year, but you're Lord Lieutenant, as you say, for at least 10 years, and in some cases more. And we should be very grateful that uh, the tradition of public service, which your family has um, carried on for some hundreds of years, continues. So, thank you very much.